See, the professionals sort of already had that on. Shoot. Good morning. I was delighted that Chris asked me to come back and share another message with you. Jim was kind enough to give me some words of advice this week. He said, don't preach at them, just tell them some stories. And I said, okay. And he said, don't talk too long. <laughs> Apparently sometimes I do. So thank you, Jim, for your advice. Now, if you could see my folder, it's 20 pages. But the font is quite large because when you reach a certain age, you appreciate large font. <laughs> when I was little, I was um, convinced that there were monsters who lived under my bed and in my closet. I don't remember being um, terrified by that. It wasn't uh, that I wouldn't go to my room at night or wouldn't go to sleep, but I knew that they were there. There was one under my bed and one under my closet. Um, it didn't matter that my parents told me there were no monsters. They just weren't smart enough to know that they were really there. When there are monsters under your bed or in your closet, there are things that you can do to protect yourself. And I, of course, followed those things to a T. First of all, you never, even, even if you're really, really, really warm, you never stick a foot out of the covers, right? Thank you for nodding, like maybe you've done this too. You never, never let an arm hang over the edge of the mattress. That is taunting the monsters, a recipe for disaster. And as far as the monster in the closet, as long as the door is closed tightly, you're fine. You're fine. If that door is ajar, even just a little bit, that monster will come out. And so I followed all those rules, and, um, and I was fine. Night after night, I was fine. And at some point, I, I recognized the monster under the bed and the monster in the closet were ridiculous. There was no monster under the bed. There was no monster in the closet. That was totally ridiculous. And I, I saw the error of my ways. But there are other ugly, scary things that I began to encounter. You know that voice that says, you're not enough. And I probably first started hearing that voice in middle school that voice who says, you're not cute enough, you're not popular enough, you don't wear the right clothes often enough, you're not athletic enough, you're not smart enough. And if you didn't encounter the voice of not enough in, in middle school, then probably in high school you did at some point, or maybe even as an adult, you hear that voice of you're not enough. And so you can fill in the blank, you're not enough. You're not good enough, you're not talented enough, you're not educated enough, you're not experienced enough, you're not funny enough, you're not thin enough. You don't have enough stuff, you don't have enough time, you don't have enough wealth. That voice of not enough. And so when the opportunity comes to maybe lead a life group or serve on a committee, or teach a, a class to the youth or to the children. Immediately, you listen to that voice of not enough. Oh, I, I've never done that before. I'm not experienced enough. I couldn't possibly do that. I don't have enough talent. I don't think quickly enough on my feet to work with the youth. And so you listen to that voice of not enough, and you miss an opportunity to serve. We buy into this voice of not enough, don't we? But if we look at the Bible, the Bible's actually full of people who thought they weren't enough. Isn't that nice? People we can relate to. If the Bible was just full of, of characters like Spider-Man and Batman and The Flash and Aquaman, well, maybe not Aquaman, he's not really all that special, um, but, you know, the other, the other superheroes, you know, it would be hard to relate to those stories. It would be hard to put myself in that position and, and get everything I need to out of those Bible stories. But instead, the Bible is full of all these characters that if we look, sometimes we can say, oh, yeah, I felt that way. I've done that. I missed that opportunity. 
one of the first characters that, that comes to my mind is Moses. So one time, God came to Moses in the form of a burning bush, and he said, Moses, I want to talk to you. But don't look at me, because I'm God, and, and you're not. And so I just, we're just going to talk. And so they talked. And God said, you know, your people, the Israelites, they've been held prisoner slaves of the Egyptians. They're sick and tired of it. They've been asking me, can you do something? And I'd like to. And so I choose you. And, and you're going to go talk to the Pharaoh, and you're going to free your people, and, and, and then they'll live happily ever after. And immediately Moses said, oh, I'm not important enough to do this job, God. You've, you've got the wrong guy. But he didn't stop there. He went on and he said he wasn't qualified. He didn't have a degree in political science or communication. He'd flunked his speech class. He just wasn't going to be the right guy for that job. And then Moses said to God, what if they don't listen to me? I mean, then what, what would I do then? I could go give your message, but then if they don't listen, no, no, I wouldn't know what to do then. I'm not, I'm not enough for this. And then Moses kept going, and he said he wasn't a very good speaker. He was slow of speech, he said. So in essence, Moses was saying, God, you've made a mistake. You don't want me to do this job. Can you imagine having a face-to-face -face conversation, or in this case, face-to-bush conversation with God, and God has chosen you to do something great, and instead of, of accepting that, you start listing off all the reasons why you're not enough for that job. But Moses isn't the only one to have done that. Gideon did that too. Those Israelites, this time they were having problems with the Midianites, and an angel of the Lord came to Gideon and said, Gideon, God has heard your people's cries, and he's going to use you to help the Israelites overcome the Midianites. And right away, Gideon's like, me? My clan is the weakest clan out of everybody, and I'm the least of all the people in my clan. So clearly, I'm not experienced enough. I'm not qualified for this. I'm not enough. You've made a mistake, God. Find someone else. And then it wasn't just Moses and Gideon, it was Elijah. Elijah, who was a prophet of, of God's, and he was all big and bold and, and excited to take on this, this job of being God's prophet. And then just a few verses later, somebody threatened to kill him. Jezebel had this plan and was plotting to kill Elijah, and Elijah got wind of that, and so he ran away. He wasn't brave enough to stay and face the job that God wanted him to do. And then there was Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah that he knew Jeremiah even before Jeremiah was formed in his mother's womb. And God said, I set you apart. I appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Can you imagine God telling you something like that? Wow. And instead, Jeremiah responded by saying, wait a minute. I'm just a, a young guy, I'm not old enough, and I don't have any experience in this. Find someone else. Now this next thing, we don't read about this in the Bible, but if I use my imagination, I can picture this happening. Jesus has been crucified. He's risen from the dead. He is getting ready to, to leave earth, and he's meeting with his disciples, and he's giving them the great commission, go therefore into all the nations and baptize everyone into the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and, and tell them to obey all the commandments that I've ever given. And I can imagine the disciples were standing there going, okay, 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 wow, this is big, okay. But I can imagine Peter thinking, you know, just a few weeks ago, when the going got tough, I denied I even knew Jesus. Not once, but three times. I might not be steadfast enough for this job. And then there was Thomas. Thomas might have been thinking, oh, you know what? I'm the one who doubted that you even rose from the dead. I had to see your hands for myself. I had to see the scars for myself to believe it was really you. So I don't know if I have enough faith for this job. That voice of not enough, it speaks to us all. It's out to deceive 
and destroy and diminish and to keep us from using the gifts and the talents that God has given to each of us. And God doesn't just give us those gifts and talents to be nice. He gives us those gifts and talents with the expectation that we will use them to further his kingdom, to be his hands and his feet and his voice here on earth. And when we listen to the, that voice of not enough, we miss those opportunities. My mom's here this morning, and I have a story to share about my mom. This is her story. When I was born, my parents were building a house, and I was late. No, no, I was early, and the house was late. It's a bad combination in the dead of winter in central Michigan. But they went in, from the hospital with me to their new home. And this house was far, far away from anyone that my mom knew. It was long distance for her to call anybody that she knew, friend or family. My dad took their only car to work six days a week, in about an hour away into Detroit. And my mom was stuck there. She's never really used that word, stuck, but I, I think that's been implied. With me, with this new baby that she was slightly terrified of because she had no experience with new babies. And you know, it wasn't like you could um, Skype with someone or Google something to find out how do I take care of this baby. So she was slightly terrified of me. And she used to sit in the picture window in her living room and look across the street to Gloria Roback's house. Now, one of the first things that mom noticed about Gloria Roback, Gloria Roback had her own car. This woman could come and go as she pleased. I think my parents were married 12 or 13 years before my mom had her own car. So that was big. That was big that Gloria Roback had a car. And then Gloria Roback had two daughters, Lori and Becky, and they could actually play outside unsupervised. That's right, Gloria got a break. <laughs> Winter turned to spring, and as my mom sat in the window and looked across, she noticed that Gloria had beautiful, beautiful perennials coming to life. She had bushes and trees and flowers. My mom had dirt, which turned to mud in the spring rains. And when they planted grass, they, there was a terrible rainstorm, and all the grass seed washed down the hill to the havens. And the havens had a really beautiful yard. And we were stuck with the mud and the dirt. Oh, but Gloria's yard was so lovely. My mom sat on cardboard boxes and crates for chairs in their dining room. My dad said if he had known how expensive curtain rods were, they never would have built a house. And they had a sheet tacked up over their bedroom window for I don't know how long. And my mom used to look at Gloria's house and think, oh, I bet it's filled with the latest HGTV fashions and trends. I bet she has all the latest colors and styles. One day, Gloria invited my mom over for coffee. Very exciting for my mother. She could finally get a look inside that house and make a new friend. And so she went over there, and when she was seated in Gloria's living room, my mom could see out Gloria's window and could see her house. And it kind of took her breath away. It wasn't that we lived in some fancy house. It was just a ranch house in the early 1960s. But my mom said she'd never stood that far back and really looked at it before, and how beautifully it was framed by this woods back behind the house. My mom had been so busy looking at Gloria Roback's car and Gloria Roback's house and Gloria Roback's kids and Gloria Roback's landscaping and imagining Gloria Roback's furnishings that she wasn't taking time to appreciate her own things. How often do we do that? And in this day of technology, I think it's really easy to get sidetracked with that, isn't it? Because we see other people's vacations on Facebook, and somebody tweets about something, some new gadget that they have, or there's an Instagram picture that shows a party that maybe we weren't invited to. And, and it's easy to look at other people's lives, and it's easy to miss out on what we have, what we should be grateful for. And it's easy to overlook our own gifts and talents if we're always comparing ourselves to somebody else. Gloria Roback 
did not have it as made as much as my mother thought. She was a human. There were issues there, too. But my mom learned a big lesson, and I love that she shared that story with me and with my brother, because we can learn from that, too. So don't spend your time looking at somebody else's appearance or their talents and gifts and their stuff. We want to focus on ourselves, our gifts, our talents, and what God wants us to do. What's our calling in life? This next part is taken from a book written by Renee Swope. And the book is called A Confident Heart. And I just love this. I love this. Because I think that voice of not enough speaks to so many of us. And Renee has written some words of encouragement when we run into that. When you feel inadequate, God says, you are chosen. God chose Moses. God chose Gideon. God chose Elijah. God chose Jeremiah. Jesus chose those disciples. God chooses you today. And God still chooses you tomorrow and the next day. You are chosen. And the really cool thing is you could look through the Bible and you could find many, many Bible verses that would support that. But the one that I found was 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation a people for his own possession, that you proclaim the greatness of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You are chosen. When you feel afraid, God says, no, you are redeemed. It doesn't matter how checkered your past is. God wants to use you. Did you know that Moses once killed a man and buried him in the sand? Maybe that's why he was coming up with all those excuses with God. Maybe he thought his past made him not the right candidate for the job. His checkered past. But God says, nope, you're redeemed. And when we ask for forgiveness, God says, the Bible says that God removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. He just doesn't set them here so that you can still look at them and think about them. He takes them as far away as the east is from the west. Isaiah 43.1 says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. I love that. Summoned you by name. He doesn't just say, okay, everybody at CCW, let's get up. Let's go through the pearly gates. No, he has called you by name. When you feel forgotten, God says, you are remembered. I remember you, says God. Isaiah 43.10 says, do not fear, for I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You are remembered. And Jesus tells the story of the good shepherd who has the hundred sheep and the one wanders away. And what does the good shepherd do? The good shepherd leaves the 99 and he doesn't stop looking until he found that lost sheep and brings him back. He doesn't say, oh shoot, 99 are good enough. It's almost 100. You are remembered. When you feel unable, God says, no, you are able. Philippians 4 verse 1 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When you feel worthless, God says, oh no, you are called and you are priceless. You are priceless. Psalms 56 8 says that God has collected all my tears in a bottle and he's recorded each one in his book. That's how important I am to God. He knows how many hairs are on my head. That's how important we are. When we feel insecure, God says, no, you are secure. One of my favorite verses since becoming a grandmother is Deuteronomy 33, 12. I, you know, I get to sit and hold my beautiful grandson sometimes, and I can feel him relax and sometimes drift off to sleep in my arms, and that is just the best feeling. But this is kind of like we're in the arms of God. Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for she, he shields him all day long, and the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. 
And then one of my all-time favorites, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans for your hope and your future. When you feel unloved, God says, oh no, you are loved. You are pressured, precious and honored in my sight, and I love you. And of course, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Now, if I'm really honest, that's the one I struggle with, the you are loved. There are times when Chris stands up here, you know this, you've heard him say, God is crazy in love with you. Have you heard him say that? God is crazy in love with you. And I always kind of giggle when he says that, but I kind of cringe too. Because I think, well, God would have to be a little crazy to love me. Because although I might look polished up on the outside, I know my insides. I know that I fall short, that I make mistakes, that I pass by opportunities. I can be terribly selfish. I don't always get things right. And I see those cracks and crevices where all that dirt is inside my heart. And so when Chris stands up here and he says, God is crazy in love with you, you know what I think? I think he is crazy in love with everybody else here, especially Dar, because that woman (laughs) can cook. That woman can cook. Dar, are you here? Is she here this morning? Will you? Oh, she's missing it. You tell her. I I called her out. I called her out. That woman can cook, plus... You know what she does on Facebook? She just puts open invitations on Facebook. Hey, y'all, come on over and sit on my porch, and we'll visit. The pool's open. I've got snacks. Come on over. Woo! She uses her gifts of hospitality. I believe that God is crazy in love with Reed. You know, Reed gives so much of his time to the band and to this church. He uses his, his gifts and talents every week. Oh, that he leads us, the worship service is just wonderful. And, and I, I believe that God is crazy in love with Reed. Tracy Koblenz. Yep, heads are nodding, you know what I mean. God is crazy in love with Tracy Koblenz. I picture her as the glue that holds that church office together. She's quietly using her gifts of organization and administration to get things done here each and every week. So it's easy for me to believe that God loves all of you, but especially Dar and Reed and Tracy. But here's the truth. God doesn't love Dar because she's a great cook. And he doesn't love Dar because she has an open invitation on Facebook to invite people over. He loves Dar because she exists. He loves Dar because she's breathing. She doesn't have to do anything to earn that love, and she can't. Because God, from the minute she was being formed, the minute that that happened, God was already crazy in love with her. He loved her to the max. He can't love her more than he already does. If Reed could not carry a tune, God would still love Reed. If Reed sat in the back corner, arrived late, and left early every week, and never was up here again, God would still love Reed to the max. Because our actions don't determine whether or not God loves us. And God doesn't love Tracy because she's efficient and pleasant in the church office. He loves Tracy because she's his child. He's crazy in love with her because she's here. God has always loved Tracy to the max, and he always will. And when I listen to the voice of not enough, I miss out on the knowledge, the confidence, the assurance that God loves me too, and he loves you. God knows me, he sees it all, and he still loves me. God knows you, he sees it all, and he still loves you. If you've ever thought that God can't be crazy in love with you because you're somehow not enough, then hear this, you are enough. You are enough, and Jesus is the reason for that, because he came here, he took all the baggage, all the garbage to the cross. 
He bridged that gap in a way that we could never, never do. He took that all upon himself so that we could be enough, that we could stand before God and be enough. So tell that voice that speaks doubt into your ear that you're not going to listen. You tell that voice that you have a God who loves you and thinks you're enough, and although the task seems great, you have confidence. Tell that enemy that he's a liar, and the message of not enough is as ridiculous as the monsters who used to live under my bed and in my closet. Be willing to step out with your faith. When you have an opportunity to do so, use your gifts and talents. And I'll close with this. This is one of my favorite things. While praying one day, a woman asked, Who are you, God? Who are you, really? And God answered, I am. And she waited, and she thought a minute, and she said, but who is I am? Who is that, really? And God replied, I am peace, I am grace, I am joy. I am strength, I am safety, I am shelter, I am power, I am comforter, I am creator, I am the beginning and I am the end, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am love. With tears in her eyes, the woman looked up toward heaven and said, wow, that's a lot. And God, if you're all that, who am I? And God whispered and brushed the tears from her cheek, and he said, you are mine. You are his. You are enough because you are his. You are enough because you are his. No matter what's happened in the past, no matter what's happening right now, you are enough because you are his. Let's close with prayer. Dear God, thank you for this reminder that we belong to you and that with you all things are possible. Lord, that voice of not enough can be so loud. That voice of not enough can keep us from doing the things that, that you put us here to do. Lord, we would just ask that that voice would quiet down, that we could ignore that voice of not enough, that we could step out in faith and trust you and be confident that we are yours, and because we are yours, we are enough. Amen. Amen.